participants are on board, so we don't want to start before. So. Yeah? Can they hear us? I'm just holding the microphone like this, but... Okay. okay. <laughs> it's very odd to hear your own voice. <laughs> okay, thank you for joining this session. You know, it's really nice that all of you are here. It's always a pity in these conferences when it breaks out into the parallel sessions. You know, you lose a lot of people who are running around, but it's nice to see that you're interested in the topic. Uh, this, uh, I will be very brief because we have allotted 10 minutes to the speakers. So it's really short, and I don't want to take away too much time as far as possible. Uh, this, uh, this session is on economies and policies for a just transition. And of course, I knew what a just transition was, but I got curious yesterday, and I was Googling what exactly is the current thinking on just transitions, and it looks really complicated. There are at least eight principles of what a just transition should be. But primarily, it says that transition policy packages need to identify and address not only environmental, but also economic and social challenges and opportunities. And the long-term success of climate action and a just transition depends on how well people's rapidly and frequently changing needs in the face of intensified risks, adverse impacts, impacts and new work requirements are met. So that kind of goes back to what discussion we had this morning on looking at jobs, looking at a number of you know, challenges that are related to just transitions and climate change. So in this session, I got the, the presentations from all the speakers. We focus on three questions. How do current actions and policies affect the transition to a just climate friendly future that benefits health? What are the economic implications of this transition? We have one or two speakers who will talk about the economic implications. And what are the current gaps in policies in this transition process? We have some speakers who will address the gaps and the challenges in this transition process and how we can fill those. I will not introduce the speakers. I think uh, I would very much appreciate if the speakers introduce themselves. <laughs> much easier. But I think you've looked at all the, all the presentations. And it's a really interesting mix looking at policymakers, looking at uh, costs related to temperature changes, looking at universal health coverage, so a number of interesting topics. So please spend about one second in the beginning and introduce who you are. Thank you. And we start with the first talk, which is by Usha Dalal uh, on green dreams and local realities and the complexities of the European Union's energy transition. Would you mind introducing the next speaker when you're done, if you can? It's up here. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or I'll come back. Uh, I don't know. Come back. So I put it like this. Or... Is it good? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. I'm. Uh, mm, let me start the presentation. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm Usha Dahal from University of Tartu, Estonia. And today I'm talking about European Green Deal and how it is affecting the uh, <clears throat> local's health and well being. Um, uh, I'm also presenting on behalf of my other authors, Katy, Hans, and Martin. So, European Green Deal, after several market-based and regulatory measures, for the first time made the climate neutrality a legal obligation, and it laid the integrated long-term transition plan. But also, for the first time, it addressed the distributional consequences. That means, but also all economic areas are affected. But there aren't any uh, studies uh, that uh, focus on the climate and energy policies uh, ha ha impact on health and well-being. Uh, so we took the Estonian case where 73% of the energy supply is dependent on carbon intensive oil sale energy system. And in the industrial area, majority of the people living are there Russian speaking and whose uh, socioeconomic condition is quite poor. But with the Green Deal, Estonia is also transitioning to the sustainable energy system. That also means uh, changing economic systems that is connected to the energy system. So we pose two research questions. Uh, one is like how the energy and health and well-being systems are interacting in context of the energy transition and how this interaction might affect the locals' health and well-being. So this is Estonia. And all these uh, oil cell production and mining areas shown in brown are located in one specific, this is Estonia, so in one specific like county, uh, Idavil, and it also shares the border with uh, Russia. And uh, we took the concepts from three theoretical backgrounds. Uh, the determinants of health really tells us about uh, there are multiple factors affecting health and well-being, like environmental, social, economic, living and working conditions. 
Um, and the social technical systems is really about how people in the oil cell technology and industry are socializing this uh, technology in their everyday understanding practices, culture, but also policy uh, and uh, science arenas, how they are interacting in different dimensions. And the production of a space really gives us the lens that um, uh, uh, the space is uh, produced socially by different actors. So here is a physical space and material space where everyday routine activities are practiced. And then there are mental spaces or symbolic uh, uh, abstract uh, space like maps, plans, designs developed by the authorities or technocrats to legitimize and control space. And there is this um, very subjective and emotional space created by the uh, inhabitants or locals living in this space, like feelings and memories. So this is a very qualitative research data coming from interviews and uh, document analysis. But in the data analysis, we use the systems thinking approach to build the causal loop diagrams. So there are different feedback loops and pathways affecting uh, that shows how the health and well-being of the locals are being impacted from the interaction uh, uh, between two systems. So there are 12 different reinforcing loops and three balancing loops and more than 50 pathways that don't make any loops but are affecting these uh, loops above. So this is a big uh, holistic picture of the causal loop diagram. Uh, you don't have to read it because it's not meant to read here, but the really key uh, takeaway here is these are these uh, area where the health and well-being are being affected and the rest of them are really the dimensions being interacting in the uh, social and uh, social and economic dimensions. But I will walk you through some of the loops here, many of the loops here. So here, uh, uh, this is the oil cell based uh, energy and economic system. And then it has really two uh, aspects, negative environmental health, uh, um, ne negative environmental consequences and socioeconomic externalities that could be both positive and negative. But here's how the inhabitants are socializing this technology. There are uh, around uh, 1,500, um, 5,800 people are employed. And then around 16,000 uh, people are dependent on these uh, employed people. But over the years, uh, they are also creating the symbolic meaning, like mining as their own tradition. And then it sort of became uh, the inhabitants started producing their sociocultural and economic spaces around the oil cell industries. Uh, the error here with positive sign implies that the variables, these two variables are uh, have a direct relationship. Uh, but the downside um, of the socializing the technology is that um, their ability to adapt to the socioeconomic changes is really undermined uh, because they created their space around the oil cell industries and they have uh, their level of multilingual skills uh, is not improved uh, and it affected their education, vocational training, then later knowledge uh, and skills. And on the long run, it affected their empowerment level. And here, this uh, uh, dashed line with the negative uh, sign implies that these two variables have the inverse relationship. And these two lines shows that uh, uh, it has a delayed effect. But actors are also socializing the technology in terms of the revenue uh, getting from the environmental taxes here and the income tax. And they are also pro that uh, helps to provide them the welfare services. And some of the municipalities are heavily dependent on these uh, tax systems. Uh, well, the, that dependence also has the downside. Uh, so a local government has this really vicious cycle of developing the local plan and they don't have any funding because the funding sources are really limited, financial sources are, and the human resources, resources are also limited. And then at the end, they have this accumulation of uh, social and infrastructure problems. Uh, and this is going like for more than 20 years, according to the interview. And here comes the Green Deal, the uh, energy transition policy. Uh, and it has a pressure on different arenas like the alternative energy supply and phasing out the oil cell industry. Uh, uh, but that also means uh, that there will be no taxes uh, from these, uh, no revenues from these uh, different oil cell based uh, tax systems. And good thing is that uh, the European Green Deal has this uh, policy response by a just transition fund, 340 million for Estonia. Uh, and the 80% of funding is like on the business and jobs and 20%, uh, which is like really low, is uh, for the environment and the social inclusion uh, aspects. 
but these are like very top-down approach. And then the implication is like the inhabitants are not really feeling that they will get the jobs. Uh, so, uh, and there are no other any programs that will address their concern on the uncertainty of their social cultural um, space around the oil cell industries. Um, but the, uh, on the positive note, uh, it, uh, the funding is really helping the government because it kind of adds uh, to the money system. And um, how this top down is really affecting is like there are really real concern about the local empowerment level if the government is on more focusing on job opportunities. But what about their empowerment? And it will circle back to their ability to adapt to the socioeconomic changes. Um, and if you remember the vicious uh, cycle of these local uh, challenges, where the accumulation of social and infrastructure problems are happening, then it connects with the existing level of the health promotion level, which is really in infancy stage at the both county and the national level. Then uh, ministry is planning to transfer the more responsibilities to local level. And that really means like two scenarios, uh, like extra burden to the uh, existing problem or really better ownership uh, if improve the local capacity. And here, the, uh, this uh, ability to adapt to socioeconomic situation is really uh, uh, circling to the adverse impact on mental health through the job uncertainties that induce the stress level among the inhabitants. But also, these uncertainties uh, is like circling to the social well-being. And also, it is like aggravating uh, the level of negative health behaviors, like excessive alcohol consumption. Uh, and uh, circling to the mental health and also to the, their ability. Uh, so we know from the literature the, uh, the link between the mental health and also the physical health. Uh, and then uh, the physical health uh, uh, consequences means there will be a need for short and long-term treatment or care. But that also means the risk of inequality in treatment and care will be higher, especially, uh, especially because the healthcare infrastructure is really fragile. Uh, and if you, we, we go back to the negative environmental consequences, uh, there are already many studies about air pollution showing the really worst uh, health outcomes in the region, but also the everyday level of annoyance among the inhabitants that is uh, contributing to this uh, adverse impact on mental health. Um, so uh, there were some discussions around uh, about uh, direct health and well-being impact on this alternative energy transition discussion uh, in uh, Estonia. It was mostly about the nuclear energy and how it will impact the health of the people. Um, uh, and But the, they kind of discussed a lot about the negative environmental external, externalities about different wind, solar, or different alternative energy uh, measures. But the real good thing is here, like the health actors were able to negotiate to, uh, for this study about identifying exposure level of industry emitted chemical uh, on inhabitants. Uh, this loop just uh, is just to show like um, so these health impacts are coming from different socioeconomic uh, areas. But at the end, the healthcare infrastructure, infrastructure has to face the uh, bear the consequences, and which is already fragile. But it's still inhabitants uh, in the area are still supporting the oil cell, also because the energy transition process is really slow, which they don't understand much, and also they don't see much changes happening around them. But also their symbolic meaning about uh, mining as a tradition, and also uh, the health promotion level is like really in the low stage, so they have a very poor understanding of oil cell industry related health and uh, social effects. That's how they, they keep supporting the oil cell industries. So in conclusion, even though the health and well-being impacts from the negative uh, environmental externalities after phasing out to the sustainable energy system uh, is supposed to decrease, uh, there are many other factors, uh, especially, especially if you take the determinants of health lens. Uh, for example, the health consequences related to, uh, to this uh, industrial pollution will stay there until it's phase out, like a complete phase out. Um, but there are really uh, main uh, key factors and pathways like their ability to adapt to the socioeconomic changes and their uncertainties about their sociocultural and economic spaces 
uh, are the main two key factors affecting the social well-being, mental health and well-being, and also behavioral health issues. Um, and at the end, the uh, healthcare infrastructure is really not uh, ready, ready to deal with these health problems. And there will also uh, probably be the high uh, inequality in care and treatment. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, we have three minutes for questions. I'm sorry I went a little too quick in the beginning. I didn't introduce myself or Grace. <laughs> look at Grace, the speakers, because she's holding up the time. So if you have less minutes, you know that you're, you know, over the limits of these. So I'm Shilpa Rao. I'm from the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. And Grace, you can introduce yourself. I'm Grace Turner. I'm from the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine. I'm a research fellow in climate change. Yes, so please look at Grace. Okay, please go ahead with your questions. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, for the presentation. It's very enlightening to see all those all those loops and, and how everything is interlinked and the vicious uh, vicious cycles. The question would be for people who are looking at this, perhaps from a policy or intervention perspective. What do you think could be the takeaways based on those relationships that you identified, where perhaps some interventions could help break some of those vicious cycles? In terms of uh, obviously, we're all it, it's all or hypothesizing, right? Because these are qualitative uh, data. But uh, yeah, curious to hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, uh, very interesting question. And real the practical implication for policymakers is really on this slide. Uh, I think uh, these two are like really key things and that needs to be addressed for the local population. Uh, but it's not really easy uh, because it has been developing over the years and it did not happen like um, because of the energy transition policy so there are different like social factors um, but I think this is also a really a golden opportunity for the health actors to negotiate on the funding uh, and also the really practical programs to address their uh, really uh, health issues probably they can uh, start with the social well-being and then it really probably it also has to be a bottom up because um, how the local population thinks and then what do they want. So it has like it should go both like top down and bottom up. But I think the health actor should really take the initiatives uh, on this window of opportunity. Great. Thank you. And is this work going to be published? Or yes. about, perhaps I missed that part. But... Uh, it is going to be published. <laughs> so <laughs> how can we find you? <laughs> <laughs> because we're yeah. submitting this um, uh, by the end of this month. And then probably, uh, yeah, <laughs> in uh, some months. Okay. okay, thank you so much. Are there any more questions? Or okay, thank you. We have the next presentation by Blanca Anton, who will talk about the Pathfinder Initiative. Yes. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Blanca Anton, and I'm a research assistant at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, working on the Pathfinder Initiative, and I'm also here to represent um, the project. So the Pathfinder Initiative is a research project that synthesizes and analyzes evidence on the links between climate mitigation action and health. Um, we've heard a lot this morning already on it, but here's just a quick summary for those who are not familiar. Um, we have a broad range of climate actions from different sectors um, that can benefit health in different ways. So for example, we have here um, promotion of walking and cycling, so active travel, can increase physical activity and that in turn can lead to, for example, better meta health or lower rates of obesity. 
And at the Pathfinder Initiative, we looked for evidence on climate mitigation actions with a health co-benefit. And as part of our project, we looked specifically for implemented mitigation actions in the real world, where evaluations of the impact on both greenhouse gas reductions and benefits to human health existed. And that's what I'm going to talk today about. Um, the aim of that exercise was to better understand the implementation process of actions, the role of key actors, and explain the contextual factors that influence these mitigation actions. We were also interested in the positive, negative, as well as planned and unplanned effects of those mitigation actions on greenhouse gas emissions and on health, because for a just transition, we need to know the effects upon implementation. So what we did is we screened, published, and gray literature, and also had an open call for submission on our Pathfinder website and in the Lancet Journal. And we also identified case studies through our partner organizations, CDP and C40 Cities. And we identified a total of 27 case studies, which is way less than what we expected to find. But it was very challenging to find implemented mitigation actions that had measured the green impact on greenhouse gas emissions and health. Um, amongst the 27 case studies, we found a broad range, both geographically and um, from different sectors. So one was, for example, on um, renewable energy policies in the US that obviously resulted in very large emission reductions. But then another example was a cookstove intervention in the Gambia which resulted obviously in fewer emission reductions, but had large health effects. So our examples showed that there's naturally a greater need and potential in high income countries um, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But at the same time, low income countries that only contribute a fraction to the global emissions, there's obviously smaller potential, but mitigation actions can provide substantial health benefits that are needed. And I'm going to present today three case studies. I unfortunately don't have time for more, but yeah, please feel free to ask questions or email me. The first case study I'm going to present today is uh, the Victorian Healthy Homes Program. That's a randomized controlled trial um, that improved the energy efficiency and thermal comfort of low-income households in Victoria, Australia. And the project showed that relatively minor home upgrades of average around 1,700 euros had actually wide-ranging benefits over the winter period. And these benefits included, for example, increase in indoor temperature, which then in turn lead to a reduction in the gas and electricity use, and that in turn led to a reduction in CO2 emissions. There were also benefits to health. Um, so the participant reported improved quality of life, particularly mental health, fewer uh, days absent from usual activities, and also savings in the healthcare system. And these um, also, interestingly, outweighed the savings made in for energy. So for every one Australian dollar saved in energy, 10 Australian dollars were saved in health. It's important to highlight that a case study like that obviously it's important to look at the context. So Victoria is heavily depending on gas. So the impact was quite large, but if the households were already using renewable energies, the effect would be smaller. So this is also a finding we learned. It's always important to look at the context in which the case studies take place. The second um, case study is um, on Buenos Aires and shows how a city can take action uh, that case study uh, was on a bicycle scheme and a network of bicycle lanes. So, so the city wanted to encourage active travel, so implemented an almost 300 kilometer long network of bicycle lanes and introduced the bicycle sharing scheme. And um, they reported a 130% increase in the number of bicycle trips made, um, which in 2020, the bicycle program resulted in a reduction of around 12,000 tons of CO2 emissions. And in addition to the environmental benefits, the cycling program also created safer roads. 
So there was a large decrease in the number of cyclists killed. And there was also indication that it encouraged active travel by women because women felt safer to cycle in the city um, because of the safe cycling roads. What was interesting that um, was here that a survey showed that while the uh, cycling trips increased in the city, the number of each trip was only around three kilometers long. So that shows that a bicycle program alone won't be enough to reach net zero. Um, it is a great part of a transport strategy, but more needs to be done um, to reach net zero. The final case study is an example from Nature-Based Solutions. It is on the Antarctica Mountains Land Rights and Forest Protection Program in Tanzania. In 2016, Carbon Tanzania implemented the project. And the aim was to um, protect woodland in Western Tanzania and improve the livelihoods of local communities through carbon credits. So it showed that the conservation activities prevented around 1.25 million trees from being cut down. And through the carbon credits, the livelihoods increased. So revenue from the carbon credits was used to especially to increase the healthcare and education for the local communities. And it also helped to advance gender equality. So what they did is, for example, they built a dormitory for girls, which reduced the dropout rate um, at school and increased the number of female students applying to college. They also were able um, to establish a community health fund, um, which covered the medical expenses of around 26,000 local people. And what is, was also interesting about this project is that this was kind of like a successful implementation. But we also found evidence of other projects where amongst the community, there was not such strong social cohesion. And they, were, they struggled to agree on what the revenues will be used for, who, is, who will be in charge of it. So this is, again, a, an example of the importance of context. Um, specific case studies. To conclude, um, yeah, I hope these examples gave you a better understanding of how climate mitigation actions are linked to health co benefits and our work at the Pathfinder Initiative. Our findings demonstrated a few key points. So, one is that we need transformative and large scale actions to reach net zero. Um, a bicycle scheme on its own won't reach net zero, um, but it's a good starting point. Then, especially for just transition, it is important to take the unintended consequences into account and also learn from unsuccessful interventions to ensure there is um, yeah, a just transition. And then lastly, as I said, we struggle to find evidence that measured real life examples. Most of the evidence so far is modeled. So we need more robust data. And lastly, um, if that sounded remotely interesting to you, um, our report, our Lancet Pathfinder Commission report will come out in November with all of our findings, both from what I told you today about the implemented mitigation actions, but then also from our umbrella review, which looked at the modeled evidence. And here you can sign up um, for the mailing list to hear more updates. Thank you very much. Can we have time for questions? At the back first, and then you, Catherine. Maybe uh, I can go back. So see the linkages then from the home, like what you've done to the uh, mental health impacts of, of that project. Um, so for that specific one, because um, it was a randomized controlled trial, which was a bit unusual, it was very good because what they did is um, they asked the participants directly. So they conducted the home upgrades and then they had a mental health score so it was a survey. They asked the participants to rate their mental health. 
Um, and because the home upgrades resulted in warmer environments, they had to pay less bills. So that increased the mental health of the participants. I hope that answers the question. But more information is, I don't know how well that is visible, um, but they published a whole report online where, where you can find um, what exactly scores they used and how it can help as well. Thank you. No, I think this idea of trying to look at the implemented uh, projects is really is really important and interesting, particularly to capture this idea of the unintended consequences. I guess what I so the evaluations are done. It looks like it here. It was done by the government, but they could also be, I guess, peer reviewed journal articles. Yeah, yeah. Um, but still. In the evaluation, certain endpoints will be selected for what gets evaluated. And you know, it could be that we're still missing many unintended consequences that just aren't in that evaluation scheme. So um, I guess how what have you what have you learned through the initiative about that? How do we find these unintended consequences? I'm thinking about cook stove interventions where yeah. you know if you measure um, you know one pollutant, you might be missing the whole story because you have lots of examples of um, cook stove interventions that reduce PM 2.5 but increase black carbon and therefore you know it's not it's not it, you know a, a climate benefit for example so yeah. if you don't measure all many pollutants you might be coming to the wrong conclusion about the benefit um, in the carbon point of view so uh, yeah just what have you learned on the unintended consequences and how to measure them um, in, in this actual sort of observational yeah, data? Yeah, uh, great question. So we learned a couple of things. So first of all, no one wants to talk about the negative effects. Um, so we found very little. And obviously, everyone wants to showcase the benefits to it, because there's a lot of people rely on funding to do these actions. So there was very little on the negative consequences or unintended effects. Um, what we found is, there are no standards, unfortunately. Um, often it was by surprise they were found, these unintended consequences. Um, that's why we definitely need kind of like, and that's what also we will do in Pathfinder 2, to bring together all these shared lessons and have kind of like an open discussion, a forum, so we call it the commission, where we share these findings. And then hopefully that will give better transparency. And as you said, also more standards, what to look for in certain um, sectors, in certain um, mitigation actions. But yeah, we found there are no standards. No one likes to talk about the negative effects. Um, yeah, so unfortunately, we don't have a real answer for you. But yeah, that's definitely something needs more transparency. Thank you, Bunker. Thank you. If I can invite Lin Ma and Meiji Chen to your presentation. for giving the opportunity for uh, for, uh, for for giving the chance of presenting my current paper or research on this productivity cause of temperature changes through a micro study uh, from Norway and my name is Lien I'm a researcher at Cicero and um, I, I would like to invite Major Chen to give the talk of the day uh, together uh, I'll give the chance to Major Chen to introduce herself yeah. Uh, hi, uh, my name is uh, Meiju, or you can call me Michelle. Uh, I'm currently a, a master's student at University of Oslo, um, and uh, I have this great honor to work uh, with um, Shopa from FHI and uh, Lima from uh, Cicero. So, like, uh, hope you enjoy the presentation. Thanks a lot. And just one thing to mention: um, today's work is, uh, and this work is uh, funded by this exhaustion project uh, in uh, EU. Horizon 2020. So just to give a brief uh, introduction. So um, there has already been uh, lots of papers studying this temperature changes, uh, which has uh, quite significant impact on the labor productivity. 
Um, this uh, temperature changes um, for uh, both warm uh, temperature change and, and the cold temperature changes may lead to both physical and also mental health <laughs> impact. Uh, and this potentially leads to sickness uh, for, for workers and uh, leads to uh, absenteeism. Um, and this potentially also cause quite a great uh, uh, decrease in the efficiency and effectiveness for the labor force. And um, in the end, this potentially leads to a quite dramatic economic uh, uh, losses for both companies in the industry and also the whole economy. Uh, as a whole. So the, there are two main objectives uh, for this talk. The first one, uh, we would like to find out the impact uh, of the temperature changes on the labor productivity changes uh, using Norwegian data. Um, and here we're going to use sick leave data. Uh, this uh, potentially uh, answer the question on how the population will be affected. Um, uh, on given different characteristics uh, for different age, gender, and also their uh, uh, employment status. The second objective of the talk, we would like to assess and evaluate the social and economic consequences of this health effect due to climate change. And in this analysis, we include both direct impact from the labor productivity loss and also the indirect impacts, which we refer to as the, this market effects, including um, the unemployment changes and also the change of this markets uh, in prices or so. So uh, uh, in the following talk, I would like uh, to invite, uh, yeah, I'll give chance the floor to Amisha. So firstly, we're going to see um, <laughs> uh, the relationship between uh, sick leave uh, take up and uh, temperature. Um, so basically, yeah, like the presentation works more with equations and numbers uh, at the moment, right? So hopefully you will uh, see that. Um, so in this project, we are taking uh, individual level data from Statistic Norway regarding uh, individual characteristics. Right. And then uh, we also have uh, uh, the indicator of uh, if the person is on sick leave on the day. And we combine that data with um, a, like specific um, daily temperature and also potentially other environmental variable that correlated to the individual on the day. Right. So uh, we look into uh, two periods of the time. At the moment, we take the data from 2018 and we look into both wintertime and summertime. Um, and the model we are currently um, exploring on is so uh, we, we try to run this uh, general uh, linear model um, by uh, regressing uh, indicator of uh, zero one if you're on a sick leave on uh, control variables uh, such as sex, education level, uh, but most importantly, uh, the daily temperature, right? So some of the results we find um, maybe it's not surprising for the climate change, uh, you know, professionals, uh, is that uh, we find, uh, so for the positive coefficient uh, in the summer, right, it's uh, basically we see more uh, sick leave uh, when temperature rises, right? And, um, and then for the winter, it's negative, but it's also kind of uh, reasonable because it's once the temperature drops, there's more likelihood that people take sick leave. Um, so currently we're still trying to explore the legs, right? We're going to adjust it maybe um, also using the climate change literature, right? Currently it's uh, working with a econ econometric uh, type of method to test which leg is the best. And secondly, what we find interesting and I think is more related to this, uh, you know, equity of uh, the impact of uh, potential climate change is this, uh, uh, we see that the likelihood of uh, people taking up sick leave is also highly related to their educational level. And uh, currently we can control for sector, occupation or industry, but we highly doubt that it's very correlated. So if we have the data, we'll definitely include that. So that's the current stage of uh, this uh, sick, leave sick leave data in Norway and the temperature that we have. Yeah. And now I will pass the mic back to Lee. Thanks, Michelle. 
so yeah so then um yeah so to answer the second objective uh, in of this talk um so which is aiming to assess the socioeconomic costs and this will refer to a deliverable that we current just uh, had uh, that i worked together with aspirin in cicero uh, on evaluating this um, climate change induced health effects using a, so a socioeconomic model. In this analysis, we use a macroeconomic econ model called GRACE, uh, which is featured with multi sectors and multi regions. Um, and also, it de describes the different economic agents in this economic system. And in this project, we also extended with a module called LAMENT. Uh, which link uh, this labor supply and labor demand through a hiring process. So uh, integrating this um, uh, uh, labor productivity loss due to climate change that we just uh, estimated or major just uh, showed, we are able to use this grace lemon model to assess the social economic cost uh, due to the uh, uh, labor productivity changes. So if you just look at the figure on the uh, right hand side, um, so this side uh, actually shows you the uh, evaluated cost of health effect on the Norwegian economy. Uh, here I would like to address that. The main message is that so, so there is way much more than just the GDP loss. Uh, as we can see that the unemployment rate in the assessment will be increased by 7.4% and the uh, wages due to the shortage of labor will grow moderately around 0.1%. Uh, meanwhile, the uh, the consumption goods revenue, sorry for the uh, bad uh, fonts here, but um, the consumption good will be declined due to the increase of consumer good prices. Um, and this results uh, the GDP decrease around 0.1%. Of course, you may say this 0.1% is quite moderate, but um, if you look at in the um, uh, exact rate uh, uh, monetary value, that could be huge. Uh, in this report, we also did similar, uh, uh, or we, we also include other countries um, than Norway. We also have changed uh, this consider health effect in the UK and also Italy, which is shown on the uh, left side, left hand, left hand side. Sorry for for the bad. Um, Funds there, but uh, what I would like to show that is that there are so uh, different uh, effects uh, across the countries, and that's mainly due to the different characteristic of each country, um, mainly actually depending on their own role in the inter international trade. For instance, for Italy, uh, there has been a lower GDP loss, mainly due to its important role in the trade um, uh, in this second in this circumstances. Okay, to sum up, uh, so in this talk, we show that temperature has significant impacts on health and uh, labor productivity. Uh, but the impacts uh, varied uh, depending on the season. We partially approved there is a U-shaped impact function in this case. Uh, there are also demographic factors which affect the labor productivity loss. And um, we also find that the heat induced labor productivity loss increases unemployment and lowers the consumption. This uh, in the end leads to the GDP loss for the country in Norway. Uh, and of course, the diverse and uneven impacts uh, across countries and regions potentially uh, reveal the equity issues. Um, and uh, in the end, to address the health effect uh, due to climate change, policies should be uh, uh, should be implemented hol holistically and also systematically, uh, and uh, which considering the whole economic system uh, into consideration. And thank you very much. Hello. Oh. Thank you very much, both of you, for a great presentation. Do you have any questions in the room? Hi, thanks. Very interesting uh, case study. So I noticed that you used data from 2018, which was basically the last nice summer we had in Norway. <laughs> so it was quite an extreme year because it was very warm and, and the winter was quite cold. 
So I'm just wondering, um, would it have been interesting to look at like the five last years, for instance, and see whether you obtained the same results? Because um, as far as I have understood, the models are saying that in Norway, the climate is going to be cooler, or I mean, the, 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 the winters are cooler and the summers are also, unfortunately, in a way, cooler and wetter. So you could see maybe some benefits, for instance, of for uh, out, outdoors workers who are capable of working longer periods outdoors because it's cooler. Uh, so it would have been interesting in a way to have more nuances to the data than just picking 2018, which was kind of extreme. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, so yeah, like uh, I think the reason why we pick uh, the year is exactly for the given reason, actually. Uh, but you know, like the definition of hotter and cooler for Norwegians are quite different from you know um, typical uh, citizens from other countries where you en enjoys like longer summer and fall, right? So so the, so it's it's kind of hard. Also, we have had a hard time to define extreme heat. Um, in the context of Norway. So that's why we also try to look into this coldness effect. Um, I think the major difficulties of us to combining the data at the moment, especially for Ling, who's running the regression, is because you know we have um, hundred thousand individual and we, we uh, visualize them daily, right? So even for a few months, it's already very long data set. And uh, it's it's just taking much more time when we want to add in this year effect, um, but that's what I think Lynn's currently working. On. Yeah, that's true. So so actually, for a, I actually did a very quick uh, analysis using different years uh, for the summer period, and uh, for the other years, I sort of also find of like robust uh, uh, estimates for this uh, positive effect of. Uh, hot summer uh, or, or warm temperatures effect, um, but also uh, also another uh, reflection regarding to this uh, uh, cooler climate in Norway. So so um, so in my uh, point of view, I mean, if we just check this uh, uh, climate simulations for temperatures through SIMIP six, uh, or what I find is that um, for the simulations that I found. Norway will experience a warm temperature or, 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 or an increasing temperature for the summer period as well. So, of course, I'm looking at uh, a country uh, average level, uh, and maybe there's there's a regional heterogeneity there where certain areas are is going to experience lower temperature uh, in the summer, or cooler in the summer, but. Of course, um, uh, when we use uh, for, for, for economic assessment, we need a kind of more general national uh, level temperature changes. Then uh, still, if you look at that, then uh, uh, there is a temperature growth in the summer period still. <laughs> we have one question online, um, kind of a follow up, it, which is, um, could the summer sick day leave rise the rise in summer sick day and um, be due to people wanting to take time off when it's <laughs> sort of abnormally warm <laughs> well we have to say for the current analysis we just trust the dataset that we collected <laughs> um yeah that's true i think uh, from our own uh, experience i do see that people uh, go to the beach uh, when and uh, once when the sun uh, but uh, yeah, for, for this research, we just <laughs> don't trust them. What do we have? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Bye. Can I invite Leo up to the front, please? There you go, if you can just introduce yourself. Okay, perfect. Thank you. No, yeah, okay. All right. Um, hello. So I'm Leo Mute. I'm going to present you the my first project, the first project of my PhD, which is assessing the health impacts associated with active transportation within four different uh, net zero carbon emission pathways 
to net zero carbon emission in France. So first of all, uh, the Paris Agreement of uh, 2015 set uh, the limits of uh, some limits of uh, global warming, and that imply a drastic reduction in uh, greenhouse gas emission. And more recently, the IPCC report um, highlighted the importance of numerous actions that could effectively reduce our carbon footprint while uh, promoting human health. These are so-called uh, health co-benefits and can be seen in uh, many, many sectors of activity, such as housing, energy production, diet, transport, or green and blue infrastructures. So uh, worldwide, the transport sector represents 15% uh, of greenhouse gas emissions. And in high-income countries, such as France, it can, it can go up to 30% of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And there are several levels uh, to reduce uh, the emission in the transport sector, such as electrification of the energy production, uh, increased vehicle occupancy, lower transport demand, or modal shift to active mode of trans transportation, which would uh, bring health co-benefits by uh, lowering the physical inactivity, which is responsible for a great cause of mortality and morbidity uh, worldwide. So the aim of this study was to quantify the health impacts uh, related to physical activity through active transportation in the French context. So we relied on the net zero scenarios that were developed by the French Agency for Ecological Transition. These four scenarios are more or less uh, based on sufficiency attitudes or technology innovations. And they also developed a business as usual scenario, which is a direct projection of our current uh, lifestyle trends. So each of these scenarios uh, quantify several determinants of uh, energy production and consumption and describe the necessary transformation and the implementations in the major sector of activity. So for example, for my example, in the transport sector, the transport demand is quantified as passenger kilometers. Here we can see the rural uh, travel distances for each of the scenarios. So we can see the high cycling scenarios um, with also the first two scenarios that are high cycling scenarios with also uh, an increase of walking mobility, uh, a less uh, increase in the third scenario and almost no increase for the fourth one. So uh, here's an overview of uh, the methods uh, we've used. We took the passenger kilometers that are projected until 2050. And along with a French mobility survey, we could distribute the distances between uh, each age groups. We then uh, adjusted this distribution for e-bikes and converted the distances into travel duration. Uh, those travel durations, alongside with the demographic projections, and the relative risk and dose response function allows us to calculate the health impacts for the population in terms of death or life years prevented and also gain in life expectancy. And also the life years prevented allows us to monetize the health benefits. Here are some of my uh, modeling parameters, so the speeds, the relative risk that are taking from uh, meta-analysis uh, for walking, cycling, uh, and all of that, alongside with the mortality rate and the population of each age group, uh, allows us to calculate the number of deaths prevented for each scenario and each age group. Um, for the quantitative economic impact assessment, we used the willingness to pay method, which uh, calculates the value of a statistical life year. And for the demographic projection, we used the same source that were used uh, for developing the scenarios. So first um, results, here uh, we've compared the uh, travel duration of uh, active travel uh, with the role level of 2015 and uh, the minimal recommendation of the WHO uh, for uh, physical activity, which are set at 150 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity per week. We can see that the first scenario nearly achieved the, those levels in 2035 and uh, attains the surpass them by 2050. 
while the, the second scenario uh, attained these uh, levels by 2035. And uh, the third scenario does not reach these volumes at medium nor long term. And the business as usual scenario and the fourth scenario project minimal increase in physical activity. Uh, here is uh, some result of the quantitative health impact assessment. Uh, we can see the death uh, here and the years of life loss uh, prevented, so always compared to the business as usual scenario. So according to time and across age groups. So we can see that there's uh, disparities in the health impacts and that these disparities uh, amplify over time. We can also see that the fourth scenario projects minimal increase, uh, less uh, physical activity, active transport than the business as usual scenario. Um, here we can see that most of the deaths are prevented in older population, uh, as long uh, like the mortality rate. And the majority of the year of lifeless prevented are prevented between uh, 40 and 80 years old. Uh, overall, the benefits of uh, S2 and S1 uh, outweigh those of uh, S3 and, of course, those of S4 uh, in time and across ages. Here uh, is the uh, health impact assessment. So the years of life loss uh, prevented uh, compared to the, BI, uh, the business as usual scenario uh, for each type of transportation, so walking, cycling, and e-cycling. We can see for the first scenario, uh, majorly based on sufficiency attitude, that the health impacts are distributed uh, in cycling, uh, evenly between uh, cycling and e-cycling. While for the second and third scenario, the majority of the health benefits uh, rely on uh, e-cycling. And the fourth scenario uh, has detrimental effects uh, due to uh, decrease in uh, pedestrian mobility. Uh, here we can see uh, the gain in life expectancy and the cost avoided uh, for the year 2035, again compared to the business as usual scenario. Uh, we can see a wide range of effects uh, with the second scenario uh, um, gaining uh, almost three months of life expectancy, uh, while the fourth scenario uh, incurs a, lot, a loss of 0 0.2 months in life expectancy for this year. And these, uh, when translated in monetized health impacts, uh, represent uh, 34 billion euros of savings uh, with the second scenario, while the fourth scenario uh, incurs a loss of uh, 3 billion euros for this year. Um, some limitation in this study, we uh, equivalently distribute the kilometers within the age groups, while it is expected that in the high cycling scenarios, uh, the um, active mobility is going to be promoted a, a, to a broader population. Um, physical activity, uh, we did not um, quantify the physical activity performed, performed out of the transport context, even if that uh, activity rather adds up than replace the mobility, the active transportation. We also did not quantify the exposure to pollutants or road injuries, uh, even if they are taken into account in the relative risk. It is, it's possible to quantify them, but for methodological reason, it was hard. Um, we also did not take into account the morbidity impact or noise pollution and other impacts uh, that active mobility could bring on uh, traffic congestion or the utilization of public space. To conclude, uh, we can say that uh, different carbon neutral pathway can apply a wide range of health impacts and that sufficiency uh, and active transport policies would bring uh, great health co-benefits while technological innovation uh, would bring minimal health care uh, benefits and could even exacerbate the lack of physical activity in the population. So the policies in the transport sectors uh, in the transport sector can hold significant importance for public health uh, prevention. For example, uh, in 2035, the best scenario prevents around 20,000 deaths, and that represents almost 3% of all-cause mortality for this year. All right. Thank you for your attention. Do you have any questions? Yes. 
Thank you very much for the presentation. It's really great to see actual policy scenarios uh, that are, I understand these are being proposed by a department in the in the French government, yeah, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess I, I would have two questions. The first one is quite simple. I just didn't quite understand why, if you could go back to the slide where S2, yes, this one, uh, with the, this one, where we see that the it's really the S2 scenario that according to this assessment would have the greatest uh, gains in life expectancy and, and avoided costs, while uh, perhaps I misunderstood, but at the beginning, in terms of the transportation trends, wasn't in the first scenario... Um, no, uh, in cycling mobility, because uh, this relies a lot of on frugal uh, and sufficiency attitude. Uh, so oh, it uh, uh, projects a lot of in uh, an increase in cycling mobility, but the second one actually... For okay, could you explain the distinction between these two scenarios uh, in terms of just the policies that are associated with them? Or? Okay. I okay. Uh, it's really complicated and long <laughs> uh, scenarios, but uh, the main difference is that uh, on in the first scenario we have really sufficiency attitudes that are really uh, in all policies. So people are gonna go are aren't gonna go that far, while uh, the second scenario is gonna is more um, is more plausible in the first uh, way. And also, um, yeah, for, for transport, at least, it promotes a, uh, more I see. mobility. Thank you <laughs> for the clarification. And then the second question was about um, the, the costs that would be saved yes. through um, avoided uh, um, mortality. Or So has this been compared to the costs of actually implementing some of those transportation policies? Could we make an economic argument here? I've tried to do that, but uh, one of my collaborators, uh, who's an economist of, uh, in transition, uh, said, um, because the, uh, the agency published the costs for every sector, but for the transport sector, it's, uh, it takes into account a plane and every all, all dimension of transport. So it's complicated to uh, isolate the only the active transports uh, path. He said that maybe it would be more uh, accurate to compare to the GPD that would be uh, gained with each scenario, but we didn't quite do it, not for this study at least. Okay, very interesting. Perhaps even some isolated measures such as, I don't know if you have detailed budgets at the government level about uh, I don't know, transport, uh, you know, um, model change or investing in, um, uh, you know, active tra transportation infrastructure, uh, such as by bicycle lanes or something. And I don't know. If, uh, not for yeah. the French context, yeah. but, uh, context, but uh, I, I've already seen, yes, some things such as uh, maybe like uh, doing one kilometer of a cycle line would cost 10,000 euros. And uh, my uh, supervisor also quantified that uh, with the health impacts uh, integrated, if you cycle one kilometer, you save one euro for every kilometers. So if you combine that, you could actually see the gain that you could have. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is great. Thank you. I think uh, another have one. Any other questions? Thank you very much for the interesting presentation. Just have one um, uh, uh, well question or comments um, on the topic. It just since when you talk about uh, impacts of health effects, I mean uh, the aging population is one of the important uh, uh, aspects to consider for long term assessment. So I'm just wondering if you take this thing into consideration. Yeah, actually, uh, we took the mortality projection in the demographic uh, for the demographic projection. So that are made also by uh, national institutes. So we relied on their work for the for this mortality. Thanks, that. I have. Oh, yeah. sorry. Have. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. But my question would also have been, what are the assumptions behind these scenarios? Because the outcomes are so different. I understand that you're mostly focused on like yeah, cycling, yeah. walking, but still, I mean, it's just like by the name, I think it's called restoration gamble. I'm just wondering what exactly that means <laughs> uh, compared to the others, for example. Well, so it's all it's all in, a, in, in agreement with the, like the Paris 
agreement, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, all of them uh, are carbon neutral in 2050, but uh, it's also yeah the aim of this study is to show that even if you are carbon neutral, uh, the pathways can be very different. And the project is to do that with active transportation, but also evolution, diet, everything that we can do. So, yeah. But um, I'll say, and this is just me, that these two scenarios are the most plausible. And uh, these two are kind of extreme and uh, You don't have any more questions. I ha just have a brief clarification question on the risk rates that you use. So they include the air pollution impacts because that has been an argument with cycling that yes. you're exposed to a lot of pollution. Yes. So, but I'm not familiar with these risk rates, so I'm not sure. Well, um, yeah, because uh, they come from uh, this meta-analysis uh, that takes into account uh, a lot of longitudinal studies. So they take into account every health effects that are associated with cycling or walking. Um, but uh, yeah, so they are theoretically taking into account. But it is possible to measure this, this impact. Um, here, it was too complicated because we had to project uh, also the evolution. It's, uh, I think it's more doable if you are looking on uh, the pasture. Thanks, Leo. Can I invite Isabel up to this, please? Okay. Okay. Actually, it's the two of us. Oh, <laughs> and Susanna. <laughs> so, hi, I'm Isabel Bedin Yesna, and this is Susanna Sutnoreng. We are both from the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. So, now we're going back to Norway. And I realized that it would have been nice, actually, to have some pictures or a map of Norway just to give you some background info. So, Norway is the country next door. <laughs> if you look west, I don't know which direction that is. Uh, so it's a Scandinavian country. Um, we are 5.5 million inhabitants. That means we are not that many and we have a lot of space. We are lucky enough to have access to fantastic nature. And what is interesting about Norway is that we are also an oil and gas producing country. Um, this has made our country very rich which means that there are quite some contrast when it comes to Norway, and that maybe explains some of the challenges that we'll be discussing. So in this work that we did for the MBEL study, uh, MBEL project, we wanted to look at how Norwegian policymakers were thinking in terms of climate adaptation and how this work is being done in Norway and how it is connected to public health. So um, we decided to do some interviews um, with a selection of Norwegian representatives working both with climate and, and working with health. We wanted to see how health is accounted for in climate uh, change adaptation plans, uh, wherever it was accounted for. And we were really interested in discussing with them uh, barriers and facilitators to the implementation of adaptation strategies. Uh, we were also interested in knowing more about what they need in terms of evidence related to climate change, how it is connected to health, how much do they know, how much do they need. And we also thought that it would be interesting to look at the implications of the COVID-19 pandemic um, for the adaptation work, um, whether, what kind of implications it could have. So we conducted uh, digital interviews. Uh, we did that in two batches. So we had one a first round of interviews in 21 with representatives from the largest cities. And then we conducted uh, some more interviews um, with representatives from national administrations and also from municipalities in Norway. Uh, so in total, we talked to 14, or we conducted 14 interviews, um, and we talked with um, the largest national administrations that have to do with uh, climate, environment, or health. Uh, we talked with municipalities that are in 
um, they are participating in a network that is called the eFront Netverke, eFront uh, Network. And these are um, municipalities that are, uh, eFront means at the front, so which are really interested in working uh, on climate adaptation. So these, there's a little bias here because we are not maybe fully representative for uh, how municipalities in Norway uh, work with climate adaptation, but they are probably more resource resourceful than the average. And we also talked with uh, a representative from a political unit because in Norway we have a Sami population. So we wanted also to, to hear uh, from their perspective how they are working on this. Uh, and we used a standard uh, content analysis approach to, to work with the data. So, um, in a way, it is so that the national actors like the Ministry of Environment and the Directorate for Environment and Health and so on, they all work uh, as primarily as facilitators. So, they provide information, they provide support, they provide networks to the municipalities, but the municipalities are in charge of uh, working with climate adaptation. They are committed to doing some risk and vulnerability analysis, and they include this work in, in their analysis. So everything happens at the municipality level. They have to develop their climate adaptation strategies. They have to set up their own networks, uh, and they do so. Um, they need to build <laughs> their own knowledge in a way um, and, and do some awareness work at the local level. Um, they, um, we've, we've seen that they work in a very, um, in a way, in, 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 ver in various different sectors. So, um, in, in a way, uh, climate adaptation work happens in, in, in a multidisciplinary manner because it, in, it is relevant for the infrastructure work, for the urban planning, for preparedness. It's very important for public health plans. So, it, is, it has to be... Um, uh, ensured in all these different sectors. Um, and it is somehow, but we also see that they, are, they, are, they have a tendency to work in silos a bit as well. Uh, but most municipalities we've talked to actually have some staff that is working either full-time or part-time uh, with climate adaptation. So um, we asked about motivations for working with climate adaptation. And this is a very um, representative picture, unfortunately, for what happens in Norway. That was, that's why I was teasing you <laughs> about 2018, because we just, this was really the last nice summer we had in Norway. Because what happens now is that the weather, uh, the climate is coming, becoming much more wet. And these kind of events are happening a lot more, a lot more often. Um, we just went through a, a major... Um, a major storm this summer, and the municipalities experienced these climate-related uh, events. So it was an important motivation factor for them to work with this. Uh, they also saw that uh, there was increased awareness in their local populations about what's happening in terms of climate change, and it is also part of their own mandate to work with this. Um, uh, some municipalities were also participating in, in projects, uh, like Norway, there's been um, some kind of a competition to become a climate neutral city. And this was something that motivated many um, municipalities to work with us. Um, so, as I said, the, the national, national actors, they um, participate a lot in investigations on climate adaptation at a national and an international level. and. In a way, health is always integrated as one aspect of climate change that has to be taken into consideration. It, it's always, it's integrated, but it's not really focused on. Um, it's, it's here somewhere, uh, but we don't really know exactly how that works. And it was a bit of the same with the municipalities. We explained that a lot of the focus is on preparedness, making sure that we have the infrastructure in place, uh, that the water supply uh, functions as it should, that the roads are still there. Um, we need to make sure that the ambulance will be able to drive if something happens in, be uh, in the middle of a storm. So um, health, health is, is there, but there are no really specific strategies for how to work with climate ad adaptation in health. 
that was like a, a side effect almost. <laughs> um, I take over. Yes. So one of the. Can you hear me? So one of the aspects was uh, how uh, well I, I will just say that this was a starting point before uh, it was when the stakeholder analysis was the, taking place for the Europe. So this started before interviews, and then Shilpa was uh, had the idea to maybe have some publication on Norway because there is so little, and you could see it previously on the presentations that there is a very little about climate and health studies uh, about Norway. So that was the kick from Shilpa, and uh, then we started to dig into it a little bit deeper. And uh, one of the aspects was the collaboration. So it's it's very similar to the structure that we started already with Grace that was leading this uh, uh, part for the Europe. And uh, what was the what are the results? So there has uh, as is, it has been mentioned by Isabel, uh, the most of the uh, interviews that we carried out were made with com uh, municipalities that are a part of this. Uh, uh, e front or i front uh, network, but um, there was also something mentioned that there is some funding coming from the directorate of uh, uh, climate and yes, climate or what is it, directorate for environmental uh, in, environment that uh, they get funding mostly for the networking and exchange of the uh, knowledge or experience. Uh, and then there are some other networks. Um, what what is it? Yes, uh, I, I'm a little bit puzzled by the title because there is anything else written. <laughs> uh, what was very very interesting about the collaboration was that when we wanted to interview, uh, there was no really expert both on the climate adaptation and health. So sometimes there was a one person who was representing the public health and one person was representing the climate uh, adaptation. And it looked like they didn't really work together. Or there was uh, somehow uh, uh, we talked to the political representative, but uh, when we asked some question, they said, well, we, you should talk to administration. So it looked like there is not really even cooperation inside the house, not outside the house. And uh, what was also pointed out that uh, there was not uh, not so much cooperation between people doing uh, climate mitigation and cl climate adaptation. And that was already pointed out earlier today. Uh, one of the parts of this also, uh, the analysis was the impact of the uh, COVID. So the outcome was that uh, the work was slowed down because the focus was more for the uh, dealing with pandemic, so the resources were focused there. And uh, some people mentioned that there was no physical contact, so there was less formal communication between the people uh, next to the having a coffee or something like that. But there was more uh, possibility to, to have more meetings. So when this networking uh, became uh, more popular, you, could, you didn't have to travel anymore. You could easily contact with people instantly by uh, Teams uh, or some other online. Uh, yes, I will go to the last slide. And that was uh, what was the need of the uh, of these actors. And it was uh, mostly the more knowledge, uh, more money, and more cooperation, which if, if I can say it in three words. <laughs> what was interesting point when you put, I, when I see these health classes on, but some of them said that uh, you have this kind of socioeconomic analysis that are like comparing like morbidity and what what cost. Uh, but there was not really on how people are happy or the quality of life that they would like to see more on, uh, and also like uh, uh, like uh, health cost benefit uh, that would be also interesting to take consideration too. Um, yes, and there are also conclusions. I have maybe one second to uh, left. Um, so it was already mentioned that uh, people work in silos. Uh, there is, a, again, limited focus on health. And it's also because of the um, uh, 
gravity because uh, the one representative was referring to audit report on climate adaptation. They said that if there is something going to happen to health, it has to be very serious. So uh, that must be like, for example, with humidity, with the houses are increasing the humidity, you will probably not notice that it affects your health if the house is not really falling down apart. Yes, and uh, We have acknowledgement to all the stakeholders, but also to the project and the funding. Thank you. Thank you both. I think we'll go to the next presentation just to make sure everyone get a chance and we can do questions for both at the end. Ingrid, if you want to come up. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Thanks for remaining in the room for this last presentation. My name is Ingrid and uh, I'm happy to share part of my master's thesis with you. And the title is The Relationship Between Universal Health Coverage and Healthcare Related Carbon Emissions A Comparative Analysis. I had the support of PCIPS and I was also affiliated at SET during my journey there. This is just a brief outline of this presentation. And I will start with a, an introduction. So we all know that the primary intent of any health system is to improve population health and quality of life. And achieving universal health coverage is the means by which this can be done. But what exactly does it, does it mean to achieve UHC? It means that all individuals and communities receive the health services they need without suffering financial hardship. And this is also one of the targets of the SDG number three. And it should include the full spectrum of uh, the full spectrum of essential and quality health services across the lifetime of an individual. So the health sector has grown considerably during the last decades, and it has become an important social economic sector. But with all the services and activities provided, it also became a major polluter, and we uh, we now know that it contributes to four to five percent of all the CO2 emissions globally, and the. NHS in England, they have done a great job on measuring and reporting the emissions inside their health systems. And we can see that uh, medicines, medical equipment, and things related to the supply chain uh, correspond to more than half of the emissions in healthcare, but also building energy, the use of water and waste, anesthetic gases, and things related to transportation of staff and patients. These emissions can also be divided in scope one, uh, under the ownership of the institution, uh, scope two, uh, related to the electricity purchase, and scope number three, related to all the upstream and downstream activities inside the system. So to tackle this problem, and it was also mentioned this morning, the WHO has launched this Alliance for a Transformative Action on Climate Change and Health, and they invited countries to commit to become resilient and sustainable. And the last time I checked, uh, 27 countries have committed to uh, become net zero by health ministry level. And out of those 70, uh, 27 countries, around 65% comes from low and middle income countries. So then we come to the rationale of the study, which is that the healthcare sector will progressively be required to say how they are monitoring and with which measures they are implementing to reduce their environmental impacts. But at the same time, they are heavily affected by old challenges and also by modern needs such as uh, multifactorial diseases, mental health, and an aging population. So how to coordinate environmental sustainability with other urgent needs? And what are the characteristics of low carbon health systems? But then the objective of this study was to investigate the relationship between healthcare carbon emissions and the achievement of UHC across selected countries for the year 2015. And the specific objective was to assess the association between healthcare greenhouse gas emissions, UHC service coverage index, and to analyze inequalities between countries regarding healthcare carbon footprints. The method was an observational descriptive study based on secondary data of 64 countries for the year 2015. And for the statistical analysis, I used the multiple linear regression with the dependent variable being greenhouse gas emissions in healthcare sector per capita. 
and the independent variable, the UHC service coverage index provided by the WHO. And the control variables are related to the health system profile, the disease burden, income inequalities, a bit of the energy and social demographic characteristics of those countries. So going to the results, uh, I know this table is full of information, but I just want to um, focus on the lines highlighted here. So those are the factors that I found that are associated with an increase in emissions in healthcare. And I will start from the bottom up. We can see the GDP per capita, the carbon intensity of economy, the disease burden measured in deaths per 100,000 population, and the UHC service coverage index are associated with an increase of emissions in healthcare. And the share of government investment in healthcare as part of the total was uh, weakly associated with a decrease in emissions in healthcare. Another way of seeing how the GDP affects emissions in healthcare is when we see the correlation between UHC service coverage index with healthcare greenhouse gas emissions per capita divided by middle income countries and high income countries. Actually, the correlation was not significant for middle income countries, but it was positive and significant for high income countries. Then when analyzing uh, the distribution, the cumulative distributions of emissions um, in the healthcare system, according to country income percentile, this is the concentration curve, and it has the cumulative healthcare greenhouse gas emissions per capita and the income percentile here. If we had a, a perfect equality distribution, this line would follow this blue line here. So here we can see we have a pro-rich distribution of greenhouse gas emissions in healthcare with the 40% poorest of the population contributing to less than 20% of the emissions and with the 20% richest of the uh, countries contributing to around 40% of the emissions in healthcare. The same curve can be done for the uh, supplier and for the direct emissions and we can see that the direct emissions uh, is a bit closer to the equality line compared to the supply chain that has much more pro-rich distribution. So the key takeaways of this study is that increments in service coverage and in the disease burden are associated with an increase in healthcare carbon emissions. Uh, the economy and the energy system heavily affect the emissions in healthcare and should be taken into consideration when countries commit to net zero. Uh, and there is a pro-rich distribution of carbon emissions in healthcare, especially for the supply chain, which is also uh, another reason for uh, international collaboration in this area. And some policy implications here is that achieving low carbon UHC we require trade-offs, and it's important that we recognize this early on so we can think about all those trade-offs on the way, and that uh, countries face different challenges in, challenges in this carbon-constrained wor world. And if you consider that uh, uh, long-term sustainability, it's important that low- and middle-income countries expand their, ser their services, and at the same time, high-income countries could uh, start the process limiting unnecessary and marginal care. And uh, one thing that we all uh, can agree and all countries could work is to address the determinants of health, invest in health promotion and disease prevention to decrease the disease burden and at the same time uh, having less carbon intensive health systems. Yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, my supervisors during this work, the participation of them. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions on the last two presentations? We've got about three or four minutes. I feel like I'm I'm talking too much. <laughs> um, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Um, I guess on this slide, could you put back up the slide where we see the country distributions with uh, universal health coverage and uh, greenhouse gas emissions? 
the previous one where, where we saw the yeah the dots stratified by country income it's interesting to notice here and perhaps you've uh you might have used or, or, or you might have referred to at some point to some of the who guidance on uh, low carbon sustainable healthcare systems uh there's a uh in the curve we we it, so sorry um so at the who and in in this curve it, it, it's similar results so it's very interesting how how uh, you have um, uh, done this in, in your study as well, we see how some countries actually achieve uh, high UHC while maintaining low greenhouse gas emissions. And I think this is a, a really important finding that I just wanted to highlight uh, as a comment. And perhaps if you had the chance to reflect on this a little bit more in, in the conclusions of the study. Yeah, oh, actually, thanks for this question because this study was actually a mixed study. Uh, this was the first part, the quantitative, and then I kind of thought about it. That's interesting that we have some countries that actually have made good progress in UHC, but also with low carbon emissions. And then I did the qualitative studies in specific countries and comparing why they have developed this way. So maybe I can forward to you the whole thesis and then you have more information. <laughs> that would be very interesting. But it's, uh, yeah, but it's, uh, it's a combination of different factors, actually, because um, the countries I selected were Thailand and France, and they have different reasons behind why they achieved uh, high UHC and at the same time low carbon emissions. And especially right now, uh, and at the time I did this study, uh, we didn't really have a special uh, policy or something implemented in the countries targeting to reduce emissions in healthcare. So it was mainly structural things that were already there and facilitated this path to have low carbon UHC. Yeah. <laughs> this is great. Thank you so much. And if someone, uh, if it's of interest also to um, people in the room or to you, there is going to be a new uh, operational framework on uh, climate resilient, low carbon sustainable healthcare systems from the WHO coming out uh, in the coming weeks. Yeah. So uh, feel free to have a look out uh, for it. it it's it, it's building on, on some of um, you know, similar studies and uh, um, bringing also some interventions into light as to different pathways for different healthcare systems to transition. So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, my question will be addressing to uh, the previous presentation and uh, hopefully it's a quick one um, because your presentation for Norway actually uh, let me recall a lot of you know, facts also like uh, in a in a similar context, for instance, a country like Canada. So my question is more like um, to move the research uh, forward. Do you think it's more meaningful to, you know, call like, uh, so for instance, um, cooperate with um, other similar countries or it's more important um, to look into the Norwegian system and, uh, you know, uh, kind of see what is important for collaboration? Thank you. Well, if you have to prioritize, I would say work locally first, um, because I think that was what the um, the representatives we talked to were asking for. We really need we need to have resources locally. We need to have knowledge locally. Um, we need to have the awareness locally, and and they do try to collaborate with other municipalities, other regions. Um, but in the end, things have to happen where you are. Um, and 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 some of the um, actors we talked to said, yeah, it's it's nice to be part of uh, European projects, for instance, uh, because you get a, not, a lot of knowledge from that. But uh, in a way, what's in it for us? Uh, because we need to act here and now. I mean, we are struggling with water in our streets. How do we solve this? So I, I would say for them, the priority was working locally and getting the resourcing there. also question for you because like uh, as far as i understand like um, municipality uh, actors are not taking the health into the mainstream but it's kind of a side effect and in the conclusion i noticed like it's also because of the knowledge base like how much knowledge would they require to make the health into the mainstream level uh, do you have an idea or <laughs> And again, you have the context because you have difference be between the big cities. Uh, it's also the aspect of the democracy. Uh, when you have the uh, local municipal elections in the bigger cities, you have uh, people more inclined to uh, vote for a Green Party 
and less maybe in the local uh, municipalities. So there probably they have also more uh, funding for climate uh, adaptation. So only municipality that we interviewed that is having uh, climate uh, integrated in the public health agencies uh, activities is only Oslo. But uh, but more you went to the smaller places, they, they said, well, you know, uh, there was one very nice quote. It was like, if you are in the same time uh, midwife and uh, firefighter, uh, <laughs> you are going to prioritize something else because uh, people are sitting on two chairs. They are not capable to sit on a third chair. So it's a combination of the funding, capacity, knowledge, and the seriousness. If you have to go and uh, if there is a, because this year was very specific, as uh, Isabel has mentioned, we, uh, the first part of the year was very dry and there were some uh, forest fires. So if you have to go, you have to go to the forest and uh, get the fire down. You don't think about health in the first place. You think about the infrastructure, unfortunately. But it, it, this is it, how we think as well. If, if your house is burning, uh, you are probably thinking <laughs> about other things. But uh, yes, so it's uh, it's several levers, and uh, also yeah, I think the democracy is a very important aspect, and I think also the people in the bigger places are, with maybe higher education, are more, more aware about uh, climate adaptation than uh, in a small uh, centres. Did you have one question? Okay, really quick. <laughs> because I think this is a crucial point that, that some like larger communities or cities they just have more financial means to work on this topic. So if you're like a small village, a small municipality, maybe you don't have the, the finance to do that. So I think that's also like um, it should uh, this should mean you, you should kind of work together with others so that you can kind of afford to have somebody working on these topics. So if every like single municipality works on its on its own, then maybe they will not do this. But if you then like join forces and then you also have more 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 money just for this. Sorry, but we need to close the session. Many interesting questions. I had some more, but I have to wait and ask you later. But thank you very much. I think this session fulfilled what we set out to do. It looked at all the co-benefit issues, looked at the problems in achieving these translations from the first speaker and towards the end, I think we saw that there are various problems. So thank you very much for making this successful.